Good evening. My name is Filomena Rosiello. I am one of the three co-chairs of the Milan Women's Building that was established eight years ago in the city of Milan with a cooperation between the women's movement of the city and the municipality of Milan, the town hall, that has granted a building, a public space, uh, which it owns uh, to the women's movement um, without any charge. Uh, and we formed an association, the Milan Women's Building. Currently, we have just had the contract, uh, uh, has been renewed, and we will have it for another six years. Uh, at the previous conditions, uh, the Milan's Women's Building currently has about uh, 500 members, uh, including 150 who are very active. Uh, the main services uh, that the Women's Building offers uh, are a, an information center that uses a database and uh, sends women to the services uh, that the city offers uh, either free of charge or very cheaply. The information concerns the psychological use of the fighting violence against women, um, the abortion and house. Very often all linked to violence against women. The second one is a library, which is part of the national librarian or library system uh, that has uh, essays and books uh, written by women on the women's uh, movement's history. Some of them are uh, very difficult or impossible even to find because they're out of print. Uh, and there's also your book, the Boston Women's Book, amongst it, and also a section which is novels by women. So the other thing is that we organize is Italian for migrant women that is part of the network for women who are here without a permit, because as well as teaching Italian, we also have music, drawing, and also we tour museums uh, and exhibitions in the city as well as uh, cooking, which uh, teaches cooking or exchanges recipes amongst women from various parts of the world. Then we have a cooking section, uh, which is called ethical cooking because it is based on uh, no waste, uh, no plastic, uh, and... Uh, it is ethical because it does not use uh, any meat nor fish uh, and uses produce uh, that mainly comes uh, from uh, women's uh, farms. Um, then uh, the women's buildings also has a cultural side to it, cultural events uh, that have to do with book presentations uh, and other topics uh, that uh, are debated in various texts. Uh, or alternatively, uh, we have uh, proposals and discussions on the most uh, important topics uh, of uh, the current situation. Recently, we also discussed uh, the report that discusses the relationship between women and institutions, and that's my introduction. I will now give the floor to Norma. I, I had no idea that I was going to be the first of our of your guests, but thank you so much. Um, it is wonderful to reconnect with women in Italy. I do think that uh, the Italian uh, feminist movement, as it was, and the Italian our bodies ourselves. Um, as it continues to be, is one of the more successful of the adaptations um, of our English book, particularly the 1976 edition, um, which, as I understand it, went to 22 printings with Feltrinelli and also um, has continued to be in press 
in a, in a Euro version that is still selling. I am told, in fact, that on eBay, um, you can pay a lot of money and get one of the original Feltrinelli editions. I think this says something about the continuing interest in Italy um, of not just uh, reproductive rights and health, but the larger questions of women and health that um, we have all been working on for more than 50 years. Um, and I think um, there was an extraordinary organization at that time that was committed to the investigation of the relationship between medicine, medicine and women's health. And um, I think it no longer exists, but I think it produced some wonderful contributions. Um, I was interested in Philomena's questions because they come straight off the top of the Google search about what was the movement and uh, who started it and all of that. Um, the most important thing, of course, is that no movement can be pinned down in that way. A movement is always um, a, a lot of different entities, sometimes even governments, but also um, small groups of people and individuals. And um, I think when we arrived in Europe, we had a sense that uh, we were by no means the inventor of any of these uh, issues that so consumed us that in Europe and in Italy in particular, the question of abortion was still um, very contentious and very much on everybody's mind um, and really defined um, a lot of the activity for all of the groups for quite some time. And I think there were other things happening at the same time that gave the impression that um, good things were going to happen for women's health. And one of those was the invention of the pill. And uh, the pill did not come onto the US market until 1967, but it was uh, almost immediately seen as some kind of uh, benefit to all of us. And as I looked very carefully at our very first edition that was written when abortion was illegal in all of our countries, it was illegal in Italy, in the United States, and in France. And um, so the pill seemed to be some kind of answer, some kind of solution. Um, as it happened, I was in another organization at the time, and I learned about this, and I invited John Rock, uh, who was one of the creators of the pill, to come to a meeting and talk about it. And um, the one thing that he said that has hung in my mind for 60 years is at one moment when he was describing the whole thing, he said, just think about it, all those eggs and he was obsessed with the idea that somehow this pill was going to prevent those eggs from ever turning into human beings, um, or maybe ever even migrating down the fallopian tubes. We don't know what was in his head. And I did not have the courage at that time to jump up and say, all those sperm, what about all those sperm out there? What is being done about them? Uh, but I didn't. Um, and then as we worked in the collective um, to create the first edition of our book, um, we were so careful um, to talk about all of the ways in which women could prevent pregnancy, um, how they might obtain an illegal abortion. Uh, we gave them a lot of advice, but it wasn't until um, we began listening to women of color coming from primarily New York, but also California and other places um, that the pill uh, maybe was as dangerous as it was helpful. And I think at that point, we began to understand that there were very large forces at work that had a great deal of money uh, who were promoting, not just in the United States, but worldwide, um, the idea of population control, that there was simply too many fertile women in the world, 
they were having too many children and it was going to overwhelm the planet. So uh, what we saw at that point was that, in fact, um, the pill was on one of the many things that were being worked on at that time that was going to control women's fertility. But that was not all. Uh, there was a young woman um, in Latin America um, who produced a book um, um, about population control uh, in 1975 that um, um, her name was uh, Mass, I think her surname, Judy maybe can help me with this, uh, Bonnie Mass, I think was her name. And um, I think the book was called Population Target or something of that sort. And in it, she explained that uh, they were ramping up all over Latin America programs to um, sterilize women, sterilize men, um, introduce or try to introduce um, contraception that might be dangerous for women. And one of the best things that came out of that period was a book, I mean, a film called uh, La Operación, which was about the massive sterilization program that was going on in Puerto Rico. Now, many people think Puerto Rico is uh, another country, but it's not. It's a territory of the United States. And um, the work that was done to persuade women to uh, try uh, the pill as an experiment without proper protocols or protections, um, and particularly to undergo the sterilization operation. Um, the film captures the entire story, but um, one of the speakers in the film, uh, Dr. Helen Rodriguez Trias, who was uh, trained there at the medical school in Puerto Rico, um, saw this as um, the first experimental um, campaign to start to bring the population down by focusing on those populations that were the least desirable, the poor people, the people of color, um, the women who were not literate, um, all of that because Puerto Rico, um, even today, I think um, more than half the population is on our welfare system. I think what I'm trying to say is that as the young feminists all over the world came of age, they began to understand that um, what they needed was not what they were going to be offered by people who had the power and had the money, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, governments, everybody was on board with the idea that women uh, were part of the problem. Uh, sterilization abuse was rampant in India, and one of the first um, communities of women of color with whom we worked extensively, several different individuals and groups, came from India because they had, first of all, English, but also um, marvelous educations that were critical and felt that government should be held accountable. Um, we ourselves in the United States had just come out of um, a massive anti-war movement that really engulfed uh, an entire generation and many people in the generations uh, on either side. And all of that uh, made us feel that holding governments accountable, but also holding corporations accountable, that citizens were entitled to have a voice in their government and even have something to say about what the government was doing um, were just everyday um, beliefs that most of us held. So that's what we brought with us um, when we came to the first conference in Rome uh, in 1977. And by that time, um, Italy was pretty much on fire with the question of how to get abortion rights. And one of the reasons, of course, was because if you use abortion as birth control, then abortion is absolutely essential. Um, and each decision that you make is bound up with that reality. And we were being offered, uh, as I recall, um, uh, condoms and diaphragms, but you couldn't get a diaphragm if you were not married. 
And um, if you trusted a man to have a condom, that was wonderful. But if he didn't have one or didn't feel like using it or you could not persuade him to use it, then you put yourself at 100% risk. So this was a world uh, and we were all part of it. And as this generation came of age, there was the sense that we deserved something better, that all women deserved something better, and that we could begin with something like abortion. What we did, no women before us had ever done. We spoke frankly about our sexuality and we wanted to reclaim it from the psychiatrists and the churches and everybody. And we were the first women to ever take on the drug industry, pharmaceutical industry worldwide, and also the medical profession, because many doctors were being trained by doctors from other countries, but most of them felt they had to come to the United States. So we took on all of that. And that's what the beginning was of the women's health movement, I think. Okay, so I guess I go next and I wanna thank everyone for inviting us to join you, Philomena and Vicky. And I also wanna add a couple of footnotes to what Norma said before I launch in to talk a little bit about the more recent translation adaptations of the book, as well as some of our current advocacy work here, primarily in the United States. As Norma pointed out, we came together out of a need to demystify, better understand, deconstruct so much of what we experienced as women that was destructive in our lives. And it was the medical institutions, it was the you know, largely male dominated medical profession, it was the pharmaceutical industry. There were a litany of characters who were problematic. The uh, Women's Liberation Conference in May of 1969 was the event out of which our bodies ourselves grew. And that story is told in English at our website for those of you who can read English. And it's been discussed in many publications in multiple languages. The need to demystify what was happening, to understand our bodies better, to reclaim our sexuality and define it as we experienced it. These were all such important themes and they have continued to be important themes. We didn't initially have any idea of the way the book would traverse the globe and not only be translated into other languages, but be culturally adapted by women's groups who saw the need for similar information adapted to their own needs and their own regions. So over the past decades, the book has made it into many dozens of countries. And now we see about 32, 33 various languages, adaptations, and in different formats, not just books, digital versions, uh, booklets. There's even posters for the canoe transport system in Nigeria. Any way this information could be gotten out to women was pursued by women's groups in other countries. One of the things that made this book so popular, I think, was that it used a layperson approach. It wasn't a book that used a lot of technical jargon. It reflected the voices of women and girls speaking for ourselves. And it demonstrated the links between health, social, and political status. Uh, women's groups across the globe, many of them part of what had been known as the women's health movement. And we joke a lot about whether there is such a women's health movement today. And if so, in what form it's taking, that would be a good study for someone to embark upon looking at. But we've been, um, over the years, so impressed with the work of these women's groups. And when we were not volunteer driven as we are now, but we had a robust staff, we provided considerable technical assistance and support to some of these women's groups, including with fundraising. What I'm gonna do right now is just talk briefly about a few of the more recent Our Bodies Ourselves translation adaptations to give you a sense of where it is now in the, in the, in the world. And, and to also underscore that many of these groups are not just about producing a book, just as we have not been just about producing a book, but about building a movement and building social change in one way or another and using health and sexuality issues often as an organizing tool. I'm gonna to start now 
with the most recent foreign language translation adaptation. And at some point, Barbara may uh, show on the screen the covers of these wonderful uh, books in other languages. This most recent edition is in Portuguese, produced by a collaboration of women in Brazil, a community-based group, Colectivo Mujeres Sejualidade e Saúde, based in uh, San Paulo. The book Nosos Corpos por Nos Mesmos is uh, out in its um, since the, I think it's August of 2021, first edition of three that are forthcoming. And we expect the second edition later this year. What I love about this project is that feminists who teach in graduate school programs in Brazil in a couple of the largest universities have worked with graduate students, men and women to produce uh, content that was then reviewed and adapted by groups around the country. And it's a wonderful collaboration, what I call a town gown collaboration that um, is worthy of your uh, extended reading. Uh, before that, the French, the new French edition, um, Notre Corps Nous Mêmes, was produced in 2020 um, by Or Tante. It's a feminist publishing house in Marseille. And this is a younger group of feminists who formed a collective. But in that group, there were a couple of the voices from the original group of feminists in Paris who produced Notre Corps Nous Mêmes back in the mid 70s and Albin Michel was the publisher then. This is a wonderful example of intergenerational collaboration. Then the year before that in Montreal, another group of French speaking feminists produced Corps d'Accord, Guide de Sexualité Positive. And it's just part of the book culturally adapted. And of course it's for French speaking Canada primarily. Then in 2017, um, Diana Namumbeje Aboye produced the first Luganda edition for women in Uganda. And you can see the cover here. Diana uh, moved to the United States as a, a, a young adult and she became a nurse practitioner. She is quite an amazing individual and is now on the board of Our Bodies, Ourselves and hoping to assist uh, a colleague who is also uh, trained as a nurse in Northern Uganda to produce a similar volume in Acholi for women who live in Northern Uganda. And uh, she herself has been engaged in a number of activities, many of them COVID related, but this, uh, example of a translation adaptation produced by someone who came to this country, was introduced to the book by one of Our Bodies Ourselves most uh, treasured advisors, uh, Dr. Ruth Hubbard, who died some years ago. Uh, and it was just a chance connection that introduced um, Diana to the book. It was through Ruth Hubbard. The Vietnamese edition appeared in 2014. You just see one of the three covers it was a three volume edition and it did get some support from the Ford Foundation. That was a, a wonderful collaboration as well. In 2008, Warwick, a group based in Nepal, in Kathmandu, a group that primarily worked on violence against women, but many other women's health issues, produced six booklets that were distributed into rural regions of Nepal as well. In Armenia in 2010, Mer, uh, Menku Mer Marmina was the um, second edition produced in that country. The first one appeared in 2001. And we continue to collaborate with Dr. Mary Khachikian, who um, worked on this edition and has continued to work on women's health issues in Armenia and in Europe. In 2004, there appeared the first French speaking a French edition for French speaking women in, um, in Africa. And this came out of Dakar, Senegal. Uh, Bob, one of our close colleagues was one of the um, co-producers. Uh, it's an amazing book. It was reprinted and it is probably ripe for an updating right now. In 1988, there was the second Japanese edition. Um, the first edition was in 1975. In Korea in 2005, uh, women produced an adaptation. And I do want to mention that the 2000 Spanish language adaptation produced in the United States, but in collaboration with more than a dozen groups in Latin America, 
might well be on its way to an updated version, whether it's digital or print, we don't know. But that was a very important collaboration of women in multiple countries. And then I thought I would just add in this um, Chinese edition from 1998. Uh, it is something that even Hillary Rodham Clinton um, mentioned uh, on several occasions. And she got to meet in person one of the coordinators of that book. So that's just a little quick um, overview of some of the more recent editions of the book. And now I'm just gonna say a couple of things about current advocacy work. We are working to promote um, expanded use of midwives in this country. We are very backwards in that sense. In the United States, we don't utilize midwifery care the way we should. We don't have as many freestanding birth centers as we should. And uh, at our website, you can learn more about this advocacy work. We also have been active in the reproductive justice and arena more broadly. We're working certainly on abortion rights and right now working on a new blog on medication abortion, the um, need to make medication abortion pills more available through the mail and with telehealth services. As you probably have seen from some of the international news, the United States has had such a serious attack on abortion rights. We, probably we'll see Roe v. Wade go down the toilet, as they say, once the Supreme Court weighs in more formally on this um, issue. And it's essential that women have the means to control their reproduction through medication abortion, which will be much harder for authorities to police, as we well know. <laughs> Um, we are also very active in the arena of medical device safety, particularly around breast implant safety. The breast implants that have silicone have never been adequately tested for long-term safety. And we have numerous um, studies showing major problems, including uh, a proven link to one kind of cancer. We also are working in the reprogenetics field on human germline genetic engineering, on egg donation, particularly trying to alert younger women as to the importance of educating themselves around the risks to multiple egg extraction, whether it's to provide eggs for other women uh, undergoing IVF in vitro fertilization, or it's in order to freeze their own eggs for later use. These are substantial risks that are largely not well understood by younger women. And then we also are working in the global commercial surrogacy arena. As you may well know, many women in Southern countries now have their rights um, violated consistently as they seek to become gestational mothers for richer individuals in Northern countries. I'm out of my time now, so I'll stop there, but we may have a little bit more opportunity for discussion. And now on to you, Jane. Uh, thank you. Yeah, is, is it me or is it uh, Vicky who's going to speak more about the book? No, maybe it's me. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy to go. And thank you, uh, likewise, to Philomena and uh, all the organizers for, for inviting me. Um, I think I'm here because uh, of the, the long collaboration that uh, uh, ISIS, the International Women's uh, Information and Communication Service, uh, which I helped to set up, uh, has had with the uh, with Norma and Judy and the um, Boston Women's Health Book Collective. Uh, we actually met in 1977. Um, Norma mentioned that uh, they came to the Rome, the first International Women and in Health meeting, which was in Rome, and uh, we met at that point. And because ISIS had been set up by uh, women who were working in documentation, actually, in, in both in Geneva and Rome. And we realized that there was a, a huge need to have some kind of a, uh, an information system, a pooling of information that was coming out of many different women's groups from, from different parts of the world. Not only the US, although that was very, very strong, but there were, because of the work we were engaged in, we were in the international field, we, we saw uh, women's information and women's groups um, emerging all over the place. And we felt there was a real need to, uh, for women to be able to understand and know what women were doing in other parts of the world. And this is, this is way back before the internet, of course. I think it's really important to bear that in mind. Uh, and 
our sense was that, well, actually, you know, information is power. Uh, women at the time in the early 70s, um, if they wanted information about their health um, or indeed many other aspects of life, um, didn't really have access to information that was pertinent to them. And so uh, this was our idea is that somehow we would help to foster getting information that was relevant to women, by women um, from around the world. And so with, um, with the Boston Women's Health Book Collective, we met and said, well, actually, you know what? There are all these resources aren't specifically on women and health. Uh, let's try and pull something together. Um, by the way, ISIS was covering, you know, everything that, that could have, a, could be of interest and, and, you know, that was women oriented, but health of course emerged as really the central issue. I mean, health and violence were things that linked women wherever they were in the world. Uh, so um, it, it has been mentioned this, and, and no doubt we will um, put this online later, but this is the, this is the wonderful guide that um, the Boston women, well, mainly Julie and Norma and, and Isis put together. I was looking through it actually uh, in the last few days and, and amazed that we, we had five languages as the introduction. And in fact, every, every single section in the book was, was in five languages, um, uh, including Italian. And in fact, um, so there was Italian, Spanish, French, uh, German and English. And uh, okay, there's the introduction to the book. And then I was noticing that um, uh, we, we had one article at the beginning in, in each language taken from a different women's group. And the one in Italian, Per una medicina delle, della donna, is actually um, a contribution from um, the Compagnie di Milano del Centro di Medicina della Donna. So here we are. <laughs> it was. Where here we are. Um, how many? I can't count the numbers. This was this was uh, published in 1980s. So we're here, what 50 years later? Uh, no, 40. Whatever. Uh, anyway, I thought that was really interesting. And and looking at the the, the book, of course, I mean, we were using whatever means we had. I mean, there was no computer to to even do the layout properly. So you know, we were doing it on our on our typewriters and and, and doing layout and getting it printed like that. So um, this was this was our first collaboration, but we went on to do a lot, um, especially related to the international women's health meetings, um, of which. I don't know whether it'd be nine or 10, I count nine anyway. After Rome, there was one in Hanover. And then there was the one in 1981, which was the third International Women in Health meeting, which uh, ISIS uh, organized together with the Dispensaire des Femmes, which was a, um, a self-help women's dispensary, a health, health center in, in Geneva. And uh, again, this is something that I can put into the uh, I can put into the archive uh, for you, but it's uh, this is the report we published from the third International Women Health Meeting in June in 1981. And I was just looking through in terms of the, the topics that we covered, because there were workshops on tons of uh, topics, you know, and it was anything from um, health, poverty and racism to imperialism and population control. And the obvious things like contraception, sexuality, abortion, pregnancy and childbirth. Um, there was also women and madness, uh, women's dental health, um, breastfeeding and nutrition. Uh, also a workshop on international information documentation networks and campaigns, because we were really trying to, to organize around that. So um, these are really interesting historical documents and they were very important. The, the Geneva meeting was the first time that we made a, a specific effort. We actually raised funds to bring women from, um, from other continents, uh, especially Africa, Latin America and, and Asia. And um, okay, the, the, the meetings up to date up to then had been all in, um, in the North, shall we say. But after the fourth meeting, which was in the Netherlands, they, they then moved to the south. So there was Costa Rica, there was Uganda, 
Philippines, uh, Brazil, uh, and then the last one that I know about was in Toronto in uh, 2002. Um, and, and I think they were incredibly important because precisely the internet didn't really exist before. And so this was a way of bringing women's actions together and, and to foster the direct exchange of information. Um, so these are important historical pieces. I know we, in preparing for this meeting, we've had some discussion about, well, um, is there, as Judy, I think mentioned, is there even an international women and in health movement now? And indeed, it would be very interesting to get probably a whole slew of people contributing to, to some kind of a, an archive on that. Um, from my point of view, I mean, my, my own personal um, trajectory was that I, I ended up working in the World Health Organization because I felt that much as it's incredibly important that there are autonomous uh, women's groups working and that there is a movement. There is also a lot of work to be done within the more classic institutions, um, WHO being a, a United Nations agency dealing with health. It seemed really important to bring women's voices into that. And I was lucky enough to be able to, to, to come at a moment where they were looking to engage in dialogue with women's, um, women's advocacy groups. And they ended up staying on and, and, and with all of the support and with other, other women's groups who were involved, I think we made quite an impact in terms of, for instance, just as one, one example, um, for the first time bringing out a WHO um, document on the provision of safe abortion uh, up until, and this the first, oh, when was the first one? It was, uh, I think it was published in 2001, but I may be wrong, I need to check on that. But up until then, the only thing that WHO had felt that it was politic to talk about was, um, was uh, unwanted pregnancy and unsafe abortion um, and how to manage the, um, uh, how to manage the, the consequences of unsafe abortion. So, so this felt as though, you know, all of our work and organizing and all of the women's groups who were involved in, who we brought into WHO as well, were having an impact um, on, on, um, on the institutions. So I think, I don't know how long I've taken, but maybe it's enough and it's time to go on to, to Vicky. I know well, there'll be a time for questions later. Thank you. First of all, I would like to say something about the book. The first version of the book, which was translated in Italy in 1974, was translated by a woman who uh, has since died called Angela Miglietti. And uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of us worked with her, not only uh, there was Giulio Larre, who's also since, you know, deceased since then, and myself and other women, we, we worked to work around the words of and the translation um, and the adaptation of it. And it was a very important experience um, for me to do that. It was, again, as has been said, long before the internet, um, and or at least before the internet became available to us. And so um, it became a means through which you could speak. I would describe that book uh, as a lens, as a prism, because it was something through which you were able to talk about yourself, you were able to talk about your body, you were able also to find, this is in what it helped me and, and the health women and health groups, which I belong to, it helped us see our experience against a collective or defined experience. Women did not have in that time, I believe, at least in Italy, but I think also elsewhere, we did not have a, a, an image against which we could measure our own experience. And this book came out as an image which was different from the medical image. And so it was other women. We could see what was us and what was our body and in that sense, as the words were used in those days, reclaim it. But we reclaimed it also through the experience of the bodies of other women. And I think this was particularly important to have a public mirror of, um, of, of what it was. Um, 
Italy in the t at the time, I think it might be useful to, to remind people very briefly, was a very different country. Divorce was introduced in 1970. 1971, contraception was made legal. It was illegal before 1971. Uh, in 1975, the Constitutional Court decided that, yes, it was possible to save the life of the mother rather than the life of the baby if at the moment of birth you had to choose between mother and baby. Previously, it had been the baby because the soul was pure. Um, in 1977 was the equality law, in 1978 the abortion law, and as has been said before, when you arrived in Rome in 1977, the battle for, for legal abortion was in full um, flare because previously Italy, Italy had had very many bad illegal abortions, um, mainly illegal abortions, some but very few performed by doctors, mostly performed on a kitchen table uh, with either parsley or a knitting needle. And a lot of women died because of this. This um, In 1966, the law again on rape was approved and various laws on equal opportunity were approved in the years 2000. In Turin, where um, I was based, um, the women's movement had set up self-help groups, had set up um, women health centers. We used uh, the book initially. We used then parts of it and sort of added to it, used it as, a, as if it were the skeleton and fleshed it out with um, our own experience. Uh, we also had links with MLAC, the French group, and we learned how to perform um, abortions from MLAC and from Jane in the States and uh, the women's clinic in, in California. Um, we also started taking doctors to court if for various reasons one was if they they were officially objectors that is to say they refused to perform legal abortions but we discovered that they were performing abortions illegally for money but also doctors who experimented on women um, and we took some successfully to court, not all, but some were successful. We also organized with the women uh, of the unions in Turin and formed these courses, which were called the 150 hour courses on women's health. And then we used the book sometimes with the courses had about 1500 women a year for a couple of years. And um, we, uh, we used the book, sometimes it was too difficult. We had to even simplify it from then because a lot of the women who came from the factories in those years were not illiterate, but semi. Italy brought up a compulsory education from 11 to 14, only for those born after 52. And it was those, the women who were much older had only had two years compulsory education. So there was a problem of doing, we had self-help groups in the middle of these groups. And it was, we, uh, we also used a lot the pictures. The pictures from ourselves and our bodies were very useful. We, we then used others too, we, we developed our own. But what I would say is that um, I would like to thank you. I would like to thank you very much. One can always say someone else would have done it, but no one else had done it. And so you did it. And the fact that it existed, it was like a stepping stone or like a trampoline. It enabled us to do things that maybe we would have done, but maybe not, or maybe not in the same way. So that's how we used it um, in Turin and in a lot of other places in Italy because we were coordinated. So I know that uh, a lot of, for example, we the women's health centers, we ran our own in Turin. Not all the cities had the same history until the legal ones were open, until the health service opened its own um, health services uh, or, or, or health, women's health centers. Uh, and that was after 1975. So, um, Thank you very much. Hi, Komi. Hi, I'm very happy to be here, even on a train. I hope you hear me well. And then I will switch to Italian because I know there is a translation. So, um, sorry. First of all, I'm very emotional about being here, although virtually because uh, our bodies, ourselves, uh, Noi il nostro corpo in Italian, 
was one of the first uh, feminist books that I read. My mother gave it to me, her copy, which she was very proud but also jealous about. And I was in junior high school, so she gave it to me when I was 13. We'd already discussed it, but to help me and prepare me uh, to my first period. So I remember that I read it uh, avidly and... Uh, that I found at long last a voice that spoke to me, a voice uh, that spoke to me as a young girl with a language uh, that I felt was wonderful, which I could understand. And this uh, had been uh, an enthusiastic about incredible things I discovered that have been with me throughout my life. Uh, and my, it was also my meeting with the idea that you could speak about health and sexual health in a collective manner. And this uh, was a teaching, great teaching. This uh, was one of the key ingredients uh, of uh, my taking part in Non Una Di Meno, Not One Less, which is a feminist, trans-feminist network that was established five years ago in Italy and which sees collectives and groups, individuals that go from the anti-violence centers to the various student collectives and which pulls together very different experiences. The thread that links us is the fight against violence. So gender violence, violence against women, which is interpreted, which we interpret as a structural element of society. And in this, on this, to answer this violence, we have written a plan, a feminist plan, against male violence against women. And one of the points that we discussed uh, was health. Uh, health, uh, sexual health, and uh, reproductive health, but not only that. Not only health, uh, but health as well-being. And we made a discovery altogether, which was not a great discovery per se, but I think is important. That is to say that the medical system had changed a lot uh, thanks uh, to the entrance of women and feminists in the system, but that in time it had also been impoverished and defunded, uh, which uh, means uh, that uh, the notion of feminist health uh, as a but dimension of well-being uh, was... Um, belittled. We were rethinking our experience uh, and our lives in this respect. The sense was that of rethinking our experience and our lives uh, and to do so collectively to see what health was for us uh, and uh, to do something which hadn't been done for a long time. Just one more thing, two things in fact, brief ones. So one of the things that we realized uh, is uh, that in spite of the fact that in Italy there is a law which formally recognizes legal abortion, this is not always guaranteed because of the obstacles uh, that hinder the access of women, and so this remains very important, uh, a field battlefield which we have to address. Uh, also recognizing the fact uh, that uh, thanks uh, to pharmacological abortion, there can be self-management or co-management of abortion. And then, obviously, all the things uh, which concern the relationship between doctor and patient uh, uh, which uh, has to be seriously questioned. And lastly, the other thing I wanted to say, or the last thing, is uh, that uh, my work uh, as an activist in Non Una Di Meno, Not One Less, has brought me to the Women's Building in Milan, and I think that what is essential of this is that we are women of different generations uh, that discuss uh, and discuss uh, the topics uh, of uh, 
health, which is something in between medical knowledge that you find in hospitals uh, or in women's health centers, uh, and the type of research uh, that we have uh, as women as well as online. So I think that multiplying these spaces uh, is uh, one way of looking after our health. If possible, I would like to ask Judy, Jane, and Norma one last thing. And you can, one or all of you can answer. So we've never spoken so far about one particular issue. That is to say that all that emerged, uh, well, all the things that have changed with this pandemic and how Probably, it has become increasingly important also to discuss uh, of uh, care uh, in the more general sense and how women have been once again penalized uh, by this pandemic, especially women who suffered from violence against them because uh, they were in a const constrained space, but also because of the lack of exchanges with other women, who, which also concerns uh, their health. So I wondered, uh, this was my, uh, I was wondering if a text like Our Bodies Ourselves nowadays uh, needs a chapter also on this topic. I think what we come up against at this point is who has access to the kind of technology that can combat the isolation and that can improve communication. And I don't know anything about um, the saturation in Italy of things like internet and cell phones. I think it's pretty good having been in San Pancrazio, I can say we only had one evening when we didn't have any internet, but, um, in, in other parts of Italy uh, or in other parts of Europe, it seems to me that um, it's a, a privileged technology for those who have privilege. And if you don't have the privilege, you may not have access to the technology that could allow you, for example, to form a neighborhood group, um, even if you couldn't leave your house um, and talk, um, if not on the telephone, then um, maybe um, on, on video. I mean, um, it, the mechanisms to create these opportunities are inherent, but somebody has to start the process. And we also have to address at the same time, clearly, um, and we have it in our own country, the lack of access of many people in rural areas and in poorer communities to the kind of technology that would allow them to do this. But it's changing, just not fast enough. Um, I think I see that as um, a tool of the future. Um, as, and as I look at um, our fabulous guest that we just heard from and see her in her mask, I think, um, one of the things that we have the opportunity to do today is to look at each other's faces as we're speaking and, and not be uh, all covered up. So the potential is there, but the initiative, I think, is the thing that is the most difficult part. And um, where women of courage come from is a story that um, deserves separate investigation, but it really only takes one or two. And um, I think uh, our, our guest is an example of one um, who feels that she is um, going to exert the initiative to make it possible for women to work in groups, even if they can't sit with each other. But the um, primary issue that you raised of where our labor is being spent and how much of that labor is being given away and uncompensated this is a very old story. And I can remember some of the very good work that was done by the UN uh, some years ago. Uh, one uh, annual report on women did it and then they never did it again, but how women are spending their time. 
uh, I think female labor is the most precious resource on earth. And most women don't value it because the people around them simply take it for granted. And um, it, is, it is a hard place for poor women to begin to say, I am working too hard and somebody uh, needs to help me or I'm going to get into a collective of women who are going to help me. I think these kinds of gestures have a lot of social pressure against them and how to break that pressure, somebody has to take the lead. Okay. I'll just add to that, that we have seen uh, obviously a differential impact of COVID on women's lives. If you have resources, if you have money, you have been able to survive typically um, much more than women who don't have those resources. But I will say that amongst the women who have had resources and who have had to work uh, via Zoom, there has been a tremendous amount of Zoom fatigue, both not for themselves and for working with their children because schooling was required via Zoom for so many for so long. And the um, competing, requests on your time from family members, from work, from your spouse, th- those really took a toll. So that now in the United States, we're seeing something called the She Session. And our International Women's Day event next week on March 8th is entitled the She Session, where women are going to speak about how so many women are exiting from the paid workforce. They're still providing immense amount of labor, unpaid labor, as Norma just pointed out but many just cannot continue. They are just burned out and they're not even sure how they're going to make ends meet. But for some of them, they have had to leave the workforce and it's not clear how uh, further down the road, this will have an impact on all of us, but it's a reality. And obviously frontline workers, women who have been in the healthcare um, field have been strained beyond belief. We have had an exodus of nurses from the nursing workforce. They're just totally burned out and they have left. And some of them are older. They don't have any intention of returning. Um, but the, you can imagine that the need for nurses, which has always been there, is now only escalated. Um, I, you know, I don't think we know fully now the impact of COVID on all of women's lives and children's lives. I think it's going to be uh, longstanding and I think it will be harmful, especially for some of the younger children who didn't have those face-to-face socializing experiences, which are so important in your formative years. So all of this we have yet to learn more about. Yeah, um, maybe I can just, I, I don't have anything particularly to add on the on the, the question of, well, everything that Norma and Judy have said, but I, I do just want to point to a resource which I had wanted to mention before, which is which is key in a way. That it's, it's a journal called Sexual and Reproductive Health Matters. Uh, it used to be called Reproductive Health Matters. And uh, it, it's an online journal and uh, I urge people to, to look at it because it's one of the, if not the only international independent um, movement, if you like, uh, women's voice um, or other voices for uh, women and gender equality in sexual and reproductive health and rights um, that exists. And just t- typing in COVID there, I see that, you know, there are a number of articles recently that have been um, focused on how people are coping or the, or the impact, first of all, of, of the pandemic on sexual and reproductive health, um, adolescents, um, incarcerated women, couples, contraceptive behavior, um, uh, safe, accessing safe abortion services, all the difficulties that this is proposing that this is is posing, sorry, Uh, even an article on sexual pleasure in times of COVID-19, et cetera. So um, for people who want to find out more, it's, um, well, again, maybe we can uh, pass on the link to the website uh, to your, to the Milan Center. Thank you. There would be many things to say. I would just wanted to thank uh, 
on my behalf and on behalf of the Women's Building for this uh, wonderful, very important meeting. And um, thank you, Vicky, also. And I won't add anything else. And I hope uh, that in future we can exchange, have exchanges which are as interesting as today. Um, Philomena just would like to say that she thanked very much to everybody for this meeting. And I would like to thank Barbara for all the technical organization, which is always something very complicated. She thanked me too. But um, I would like to add something which I will not put in the video, though. I think the time has come for us to start producing things that can be used by schools or again, a bit like our body ourselves, that was, as I said, a lens through which we did things. Maybe, you know, if we had a series of videos like this, um, that when they're done properly, you will receive it at the beginning of April, as I said, because this professional center will do it for me free. Um, we could then use it for schools and for younger women, uh, and also it will remain, but it can be used as a means to start a debate, specific ones. Thank you very much, and it's been lovely seeing you. Thank you, Vicky, so much for everything you've done to make this happen, including the, the endless emails and so on. <laughs> it was really marvelous to have your coordination. Bye. Bye. Thank you.